Welcome to the Psychology Book Club. I'm really, really excited because uh, we have a special episode this week. Um, many people who have listened to the previous episodes of Psychology Book Club will already know Hannah. Um, Hannah's been on pretty much all of the episodes, I guess, haven't you? Yeah, I think so. From the beginning. So lots and lots of the thoughts and commentary that you would have heard on the podcast have come from Hannah. Hannah is my partner. She's here. And this is a special episode about her new book, which is The Ultimate Guide to Journaling. And it's a chance for everyone on the call to uh, yeah, meet the author. So welcome, Hannah. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm really pleased to be here. So I'm really excited about your new book. I've read it. I think it's a fantastic book and I really, really recommend it to anyone who has been following uh, the Psychology Book Club and who's interested in the kind of topics that we covered because I think it really brings together a lot of the different um, ideas that, that we've talked about come together in, in the whole idea of journaling. Um, but I wanted to start off by asking you about your background to writing this book. What, what, how, how did this book come into being? Uh, this book came into being because I, I'm a huge fan of journaling myself. I found it really invaluable in my own personal development. And I think it's a great tool as well because it's, it's a, you, you don't really need anything to do it apart from yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe pen and paper or computer or whatever you want to use. Um, but I came into writing the book because it was something that I was already doing myself. And I have a website called Becoming Who You Are, which you can find at www.becomingwhoyouare.net. And I talk a lot about personal development and authenticity and kind of sort of creating, the, the way I put it, it's creating the life you want from the inside out. And so it just, yeah, it just seems sort of like a natural progression, I guess, to, to go from the articles that I was writing on there to um, writing a longer, it's actually a longer article, a book, about something that I feel really passionate about and something that I found really useful myself. Yeah, and I guess journaling is one of those things that is, you can really do effectively a kind of a self-therapy with. Yeah, absolutely. The great thing about it is that you you have a record of what... You, it's a great way of exploring, first of all, in the moment, exploring your thoughts and feelings around a particular subject or just kind of free writing and exploring whatever's going on for you right now. But the great thing about it is that it also gives you a record. So you can look back in a few weeks, a few months, a few years, and you can see what you've written. And it, it gives you kind of a whole new perspective on it as well. And I think that's one of the most valuable parts of it. It's, I call it, in the book, I call it retrospecting, but being able to look back and see what you wrote, you know, however long ago and sort of see it almost with a bit of distance with new eyes and also um, a new perspective based on where you are now compared to where you are there. Right, right. Can you tell us a bit about your experience with journaling and your own personal development and what's journaling sort of meant for you? Wow. Um, <laughs> it's meant a huge amount to me. I, I honestly don't think I would be where I am now and be um, as self-aware as I am now. And I, I think when it comes to self-awareness, obviously there's always more work to do and there's always, you know, you can always be more self-aware and that's something that I think is um, there's, it's not something with an end goal, but I definitely think that I wouldn't be kind of where I am now in terms of my relationship with myself, my relationship with other people, um, my general happiness levels, um, and my general self knowledge uh, without journaling. And I've been interested in personal development for about um, six years, and journaling was one of the things that I actually started out with. Um, and I kind of augmented that with um, reading around, um, kind of talking to other people as well, and just generally learning more about um, the subject of personal development. Um, I was also in personal counselling and therapy for quite a few years, which has been really helpful as well. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, it's really difficult to look back and sort of say, yes, it was this, this and this, but it sort of all felt like a natural progression over the years, that everything is just... Um, there's been lots of different things that have really um, influenced my personal development and really, um, 
yeah, it kind of contributed to me feeling more like a whole person today. Than yeah. I did. Then certainly than I did six years ago when I first started on this journey. And was did you journal before? Was journaling something you did when you were a kid as well? Yeah, it was something that I did when I was a kid, and I I think it's kind of a shame because I actually don't have any of the diaries that I kept when I was a kid anymore. But it was something. Um, it was very different when I was a kid because it was very much about, you know, I, I went to uh, Lisa's house today and I, right, right. <laughs> we watched, you know, XYZ film and... Um, but I it's still talking... It, thoughts about things. Right, yeah. but it's still the process of, you know, having an internal dialogue, isn't it? Absolutely, and I, I think it's, it's such a... I, I mean, I, I started first journaling, I think, uh, when I was sort of in single digit age I can't even remember how old mm. I was but I think it's a really um I can't even remember why I started or what I think I just wanted to like I wanted to have um a little record of what I was doing and I wanted to kind of because I'm I'm quite introverted I wanted to have a way of kind of expressing myself and expressing my feelings that didn't feel too risky at the time and um journaling was a great way of doing that um, and I think it's a really great, I don't want to say habit because I don't really view it that way, but a really great practice to start off because it really, it does really get you thinking about your life and how you feel about it. And what do I really think about this? And what do I really think about that? And just having that really contained, you know, hopefully private space in which you can express all those things, I think is a really, really valuable thing, whatever age you are. Right. And I think one of the things I got out of the book, um, which might be interesting for people um, thinking about journaling, is just, you know, I guess how broad a thing journaling can be. Some people, yeah. maybe people think of journaling as keeping a diary uh, in, in the way that you described when you started as a kid. But um, it might be helpful, maybe it would be good if you could just kind of outline what does it, what do we mean when we're talking about journaling? What is that? I think that's a really great question, and I think one of the things that I've really appreciated when I was researching this book and having written the book as well, sort of looking at how people journal, there isn't sort of a set way of doing it. So in the book I talk a lot about sitting down and writing and how that's a great way to do it. And then, um, so I originally started writing the book quite a while ago, and when I went back to look at it, I... By that point, I'd also started journaling using voice memos. So um, when I came out of a counselling session, I would make voice memo notes because then it was really um, fresh in my mind. Mm. And, you know, it didn't take that much time because I'd be walking home or whatever. And also if I had a dream in the morning, so I didn't fall asleep when I was writing, I would record it as a voice memo. So I'd have that record there. And, um, and so it really opened up my eyes to the different, just how broad, like you said, journaling is. And since I wrote the book, and I, I would love to go back and put this in at one point, but, um, for example, I came across a website called Bent Lily, which is a woman who um, is kind of encouraging mindfulness in her own life by writing a poem every day. And the poem, she publishes them on her blog. She's um, actually compiled them into a book, and it's beautiful poems, but they're all very much about what has happened that day and about capturing the essence of it. Right. Um, rather than describing the practical details, kind of capturing the meaningfulness of the interactions that she describes and everything. And to me, that's also a form of journaling because she is essentially keeping a record of a daily record of her life. But I think the, the thing about it is that there is, I think a lot of people have very set ideas about what it should be. And I, I worry sometimes that perhaps that puts people off, that they think it's something that you should do every day, um, you know, I don't know, either early in the morning or late at night, and that there's a very regimented way of doing it. But I think the whole point is, is, is whatever works for you, and that's what I really try to convey in this book is that I don't think that there is, I know what works for me. And also I know that what works for me changes depending on how busy I am or you know, what mood I'm in or what I want to write about. And it's a very, it's a very flexible thing, a very fluid thing. And I wanted to try and convey that for other people as well, that what works for me isn't necessarily going to be what works for other people. So what I try to do is just present you know, this is, these are all like the ideas that you could use. This is what you could do. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's down to you, basically, and whatever works best for you. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in everyone being different and everyone having, everyone knowing what's best for them. Right, right. So that's what, yeah, that's what I've tried to do. It's almost present a menu. Yeah. And say, okay, you can pick, 
pick the pick the items you like or pick the dishes you like. And I definitely I definitely want to talk to you about the different suggestions because I think they're enormously helpful. And I I must say you know I've really learned a lot about journaling from you, uh, both from hearing your thoughts about the book and from the book itself. And I know we've got lots of people on the call, so um, I'd like to open it up and by all means, you know, anybody, I'm sure there's people with different experiences of journaling and and questions and thoughts. So if you have any questions about journaling or thoughts, um, by all means, go for it and ask Hannah. Hi, Hannah. This is Phil. Hi, Phil. Hi. I had just a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, First of all, I've really enjoyed the book and... uh, I just want to say I've been working through some of the, the prompts, like the exercises for journaling. Oh, great. And I've really enjoyed the ones about kind of exploring uh, one's body mm-hmm. and also the one about, um, I believe it's like picturing yourself in a future future place and kind of coming up with alternate like options for what that might look like. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, really, I really like that. And I think part of the reason is that I, I do fall into that category of – uh, like feeling like j- I know journaling is useful for me, but I have this huge sense that I need to do it a certain way or properly. Um, so it, it, it the, the quick comment is just that I really love those exercises and I found those, those are always ben- beneficial for me when I want to sit down and journal. So those are great. And, um, my question is, um, I mean, I think it's, uh, the book is great. And I'm just thinking like it, immediately when I started to read it, I'm like, oh, this is great. Like it, it started me thinking about what, how I would want to write a book one day. And my, I guess my question for you is that some of the bigger projects that I've tried to tackle, I get pretty scared and I get pretty mm-hmm. like, I run into a lot of obstacles in, in working on these projects. And I was just wondering, did, did the, did the process of journaling, did it play a role in the writing of this book for you? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, first of all, thank you for your lovely comments, because it's, it's really great for me to hear that other people have... I know that I found all this stuff in the book useful, but it's really validating and really um, really lovely for me to hear that other people have as well. So thanks for sharing your experience. Um, I It's funny, with the journaling book, I actually started it in the summer of 2010, and then I, I wrote most of it, and then I stopped for about... Um, Probably nearly nearly two years, um, just because it didn't quite feel right at that time. And when I think about it now, I can't think about a direct correlation between the journaling that I was doing sort of directly. It, it, it all felt like part of the process, definitely. And I think, um, I mean, one of the things about writing a book is that it is quite an exposing thing to do because it's your work that you're putting out there. And that was a real stumbling block that I ran into um, when I first started writing it and sort of feeling, you know, I don't, when I put it out, I didn't want to feel exposed. I wanted to feel proud of it. And I wanted to feel like, you know, it was kind of pushing my comfort zone, but it wasn't something that felt too risky. Um, And I think journaling was part of working through the psychological barriers to putting out the book, definitely. Um, And obviously sort of exploring all the different practices in it and working them out for myself and working out which ones I found valuable and which ones, you know, weren't so much my cup of tea was also really, really helpful. Um, So I guess when I... I don't think journaling so much directly... I can't think of it as a connection of directly contributing to the book, but I think it it sort of it was more behind the scenes, if that makes sense, and it more helped the, the psychological stuff that was going on. Um, to, to do with my own barriers about putting the book out in the first place. And I think that was where I got the most value out of it, definitely. Does that cool. kind of answer your question? <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I, th- I mean, I think what I got from what you said, and I can certainly relate to it, is it's, it's usually if I'm running into, if I'm having a stumbling block, it's usually about something deeper. And yeah. once I work on that, suddenly it, it kind of lifts this veil off all kinds of other activities. And I, I now feel more energized and enabled to do yeah and i think the reason i actually i think your question is a great question and i i hadn't actually thought of it before and i think one of the reasons it's quite difficult to think about is that i never sat down to journal with the express purpose of thinking like right i've got to finish this book and i've got to work out what's going on it was more it was more around something to do with self-acceptance and accepting that okay right now i'm not in a place where i really feel totally um 
comfortable or like, you know, it feels like it would be stepping way, way outside my comfort zone rather than just kind of stretching it um, to do that. And it feels too exposing and too risky. And I can accept that. So in the meantime, I'm going to kind of do more work on myself where I feel safe enough to put something that I've created and that I've made out into the world and kind of do the lay the foundations for that through my journaling as opposed to so I, I think that's, that's why my initial answer was a little bit garbled because I um there wasn't so much a direct relation between yeah my journaling and putting the book out um it was more yeah the kind of foundation laying cool cool thank you yeah I think one of the things that I've found really helpful and really interesting about um the the different techniques that you talk about in the book is um really just experiencing um, a freedom to write whatever you like, you know, mm. just to have complete liberty, uh, no matter how it sounds to you. And I'd say that in terms of like whether you can accept it yourself. So even those parts of yourself that you may be not proud of or that you might feel ashamed of or that you might feel doesn't really, you know, it doesn't, you feel very, very vulnerable about um, sort of, being honest with yourself about journaling seems to me to be, or um, in my experience has been a way to really, in a way, get in touch with those parts of yourself. Is that something that you think, um, comes through, uh, from, is that something that you've experienced and, uh, uh, do you think that comes through in the techniques that you've suggested? That's definitely something I've experienced and I've, I've I hope it comes through the techniques because mm. I've really tried to, um, convey that. And, um, one thing I actually found was a really pivotal um, thing for my journaling was, um, I'm trying to think how many years ago it was now, probably in 2009 I read Nonviolent Communication mm. and that really changed the way I look at my internal dialogue and shortly after that I read a bit called Internal Family Systems which I think um, I know quite a few people in this call have read. But, um, and we talked about it in another podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's another psychology. Yeah, I read it because it's a psychology <laughs> book club. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and that, I think those two things went really, really well together. And it really made me look at, I think it really helped me get a lot deeper in my journaling and made me reevaluate my internal dialogue and notice a lot more about my internal dialogue. And it really opened my eyes up to um, how mean I can be to myself sometimes and you know that's that's something that I still struggle with I think it's something I might always struggle with but a kind of self-acceptance as well that okay that might that's okay that I might always struggle with that um because you know all these all these parts of ourselves and even the parts we don't like are part of who we are and I think Mm -hmm. the really valuable thing about journaling is you give those parts a voice so instead of you know we all have those thoughts that we think sort of instinctively and then we think oh no I mustn't think that that's you know that's horrible or that's mean or you know that's not right or you know it's socially not acceptable but we still have those thoughts and they are sort of still part of who we are Mm. um and I think if we sort of split off parts of ourselves then we are really missing out on the richness of what it is to be human and to be us you know the sort of individuals that we are and um, when you journal, I think you really, it's sort of one of the, for me anyway, it was one of the first opportunities, I think, that some parts of myself had to really have a voice. Right. Well, I guess that that's really, really interesting. And I guess um, sort of a follow-up question on that. If you, if you do have an internal voice, if, for people who are thinking about journaling, if they've got an internal voice that's a very critical voice in the way that you described, mm. do you think that giving that voice internal voice a, a place in your journaling like if you if you just like really let let go and that voice kind of you know goes to town in a journal entry and says all these critical things is that um to put it very simply good for you or bad for you is that self-abusive to to write that stuff down mm. or is it actually a healing thing to write that stuff down what, what do you think I think that's one of those things, and I, I say this with a disclaimer that I'm not at all a psychological professional or anything like that. Um, I think that is very much one of those things that is different for each individual. Because what I'm thinking of when you're saying that is that I think it depends on 
you know, an individual person's levels of resilience and right. sort of how, whether it would be re-traumatizing for them right. to see that to such an extent that they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to process it or whether it would actually be cathartic because they'd be able to get all these thoughts out that they wouldn't have, that they wouldn't otherwise be able to express. Be aware of, right. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, on that note, it kind of opens up the possibility of dialogue as well. And I think, I just want to say, I think there is a bit of a stigma in society around this idea of like an internal dialogue and does that mean that you're mentally ill and everything? <laughs> and and I, I, I'm i quite conscious of that sometimes. And when I was writing the book, I was quite conscious of that, that a, a lot of people, when you say, oh, part of me says this and part of me said that and talk about the voices in your head, that people are, you know, people who might not be so aware of their own internal dialogue start thinking like, oh, that's a bit strange, you know, but mm. we all have it. And I, I think... Um, one of the great things about, you know, if you feel ready to kind of unleash that critical voice in a sense and really give it a chance to say what it wants to say, you're opening up the opportunity for dialogue. Right. So, you you know, for every critical part that you have, there will be another part in you. It might be very weak in comparison or feel very, very quiet in comparison to this, you know, really harsh, dominant, critical part. But there will be another part inside you right. that will have, you know... A response right to that. right and you know we'll be on your side and we'll be saying hey wait a minute you know actually um i think i'm doing really well I, you know and, and mm. really like cheerleading for you essentially and i i talk about that in one of the exercises um or one of the suggestions in the book and uh, you know like it's sort of you know, i think about it like going to the gym so I, this is just my own analogy for myself because I, I do have a very strong inner critic and mm. um, the way I've kind of lived it is that I know that I have my internal cheerleader in there as well or several internal cheerleaders and it's like going to the gym you know you go to the gym to or you take physiotherapy to rebuild a muscle right to, to become stronger with certain muscle groups or certain muscles. And I, I kind of think that's one of the things that journaling is really useful for with your internal dialogue as well. Right. So if something is a little bit off kilter and you have a really, really harsh inner critic, it's a great way to kind of build up your inner cheerleaders as well and kind of exercise that muscle, if you see what I mean. Mm. Um, so just to go back to your original question, I think it's really an individual decision and it's really important to trust your gut instinct on it. So Ultimately, if you don't feel ready to kind of let that voice really have a, really have a voice, <laughs> let, that, let that part really have a voice, that in itself is a really useful conversation to have with yourself, mm. to think, okay, well, why don't I feel ready? And, you know, what am I scared of? What do I think is going to happen? And what are the, what, what could the benefits be? What am I worried I'm going to feel? You know, is there anyone that I can kind of lean on for support if I do feel that way? And just really explore, you know, that that in itself is a really ripe opportunity for journaling, just really exploring why you're not ready, right. why you don't feel ready to let that voice out. Because I think, like, it's all part of self-acceptance, and that's one of the main things that I think journaling is um, absolutely key for. Yeah, I really like what you say about, you know, giving internal uh, a chance for um, internal voices to have a voice, but also not just one of them, but looking to what are the other internal perspectives that you have on a situation. I th that makes a lot of sense because that means that you can, in a sense, be um, very aware of what internal messages you might have about yourself that might be more critical, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you're not just giving that critical voice the driving seat and letting it go to town. You're also giving yeah. other voices an opportunity and you know, other perspectives that you have yourself inside you. Um, and so I can see how that, in a sense, means that you can be very aware of all the signs, even even the signs that maybe, you know, are, are balancing out that critical voice but haven't been so easy to hear. Absolutely. And I, uh, you know, I would say as well that if you, if you want to try it and you're really uncertain about whether... The critical voice would just take over and be very dominating and it would actually leave you um, feeling very fragile and very vulnerable in a very vulnerable place after doing that you know you can always um, I think that's something that counseling is really useful for and it's definitely something that if you were interested in engaging in counseling that you could definitely take to your counselor right um, or even a coach and get support in that process mm. 
and kind of have, um, you know, just like, you know, we've been talking about having an internal cheerleader, kind of having an external third voice who can help you process the, um, the critic. Mm. Awesome. That's really, really helpful. I'll just read out what, uh, what Claire has written here. My two main parts used to railroad each other more often. It was very frustrating for some time. Mm. Doing voice generally, I think, is calming my two voices by negotiating with each other, especially in stressful moments. That was just a comment from Claire. Do you have any thoughts yeah. about that? I, I do, because I, I think, Claire, what you said initially there about the main two parts railroading each other, it's a really, it's a really great point to bring up. And I'm, I'm aware in the book as well that uh, I do sort of try and counter this a little bit, but... You know, you hear people talking about internal dialogues and it all sounds very simple and it's like, oh, you just sit down and have a chat and everything goes really well. But actually, in reality, what I found anyway and what I think quite a lot of other people find is that you sit down and you journal and they are at loggerheads and you're like, oh, my God, this is horrible. Mm. You know, I feel even worse now. And so I, I think it's it's really good to bring that up because I think that is a reality for a lot of people. And it makes sense as well because these two parts are, um, I think, the word that... Um, Richard Schwartz uses an internal family systems as they're, they're polarized, so they're mm. on completely opposing ends of the scale. And I guess it reminds me of the analogy that comes to mind for me is kind of almost like building up a friendship. And if you meet someone for the first time, it always takes more than one conversation to establish a friendship. Mm. So, you know, you, you know, there, there are those people who might become really great friends initially, but when you meet them for the first time, you're kind of like, wow, I'm, I'm really not sure about this person and I don't really like them. I don't really think they like me. And then you, you sort of, you know, then you meet them again and you kind of warms them a little bit. And then it, it sort of goes on and on like that. And that's the way that I kind of look at the, um, the relationship between the, um, these voices. So they might start off kind of really battling against each other and really opposed to each other. But the more that you actually, you know, facilitate a dialogue and it's often helpful to have almost like an internal mediator, mm. kind of, you know, like you have a referee in like a tennis match or something. So your your internal tennis referee kind of yeah. um, mediating between the two of them and providing that objective that perspective. And again, if you don't feel like you have that strong voice, um, you can always talk to a counsellor or a coach um, who can help you kind of build that muscle yourself. Um but having that third voice is really helpful, especially in the beginning, kind of mediating between the two the two voices. But I, I really, yeah, I really think that's a great point to emphasise that it's not just one conversation. It's often a process that can go on for weeks, months, years. Um, and, you know, quite often, the longer it goes on, what I would say is the longer it goes on, the more important it probably is. Because right, right. The overall sense of wholeness and happiness. Yeah, if there's a big internal conflict there, then journaling about it is going to going to definitely be helpful because it's going to be an important issue yeah, for absolutely. you. Absolutely, and the longer it takes, I think the more important it is. Mm. Cool. Um, Hannah, uh, I would like to ask you if you could talk a little bit about uh, looking back back at stuff um, that you have written, you know, some time ago, and um, and retrospecting and. Uh, Thinking it over again and working with uh, you know older older uh, journal entries. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, uh, how important is this work for you? And, and do you do it yourself um, lots of times, or, or um, how do you go on about it? That's a great question, David. Thank you for asking. Um, I'll try and address all of them. Um, so first of all, you asked, is that something I do myself? Yes, it is. It's it's something that I find really difficult. Um, because I've just been talking about my internal critic and that's usually when that part of me comes out is when I look back and there's this part of me going, God, I can't believe I wrote that and what's I thinking? And it's, and that's quite unpleasant sometimes. And so I, I do feel resistance to doing it, but, um, just to answer another question of yours, which is, um, whether I think it's important and how important it is. Um, I think it's really, really important, and I think there is there's a lot to say for the act of journaling itself. I think it can be a hugely cathartic and useful experience just journaling itself. But I, I think there's real gold in going back and looking at your old journaling notes. Um, and the reason for that is that I think well, there's several reasons. The first is that I think it gives you a distance from 
where you know you're in a certain place when you're journaling like if I when I was journaling back in August I was in a certain place then and when I look at those journaling notes now I'm in a very different place now and so it gives me a little bit of distance from myself and from my thoughts and feelings at the time that I don't necessarily have if I journal in August and then I go back the next day and look at it um because I have you know, I mean, it's been a few months, but I have more life experience now. I've processed more emotionally and, you know, it's, it kind of helps me look at it from a new perspective, which I think can be very useful because you can recognize patterns in your thoughts and feelings that you wouldn't necessarily see in the moment. Um, you can look back when you write, if you write about situations or you write about feelings that you had about specific situations, you can look back with hindsight and with knowledge and it's like, okay, well, I... I know that I felt that then, but, you know, what do I know about that now? And what does that, does that kind of tell me anything about what I was going through then? And it just really, yeah, it really helps you get a new perspective on what you're writing at the time that you wouldn't necessarily have if you didn't do that. Um, I also think it's really useful because when you're doing something like personal development, you know, equally, just like when you go to the gym, for example, if you go every day, you might notice really kind of subtle, imperceptible changes over time, but it's not until you look back at where you started or where you were, you know, four or six months ago or whatever, that you really realize just how far you've come. Right. And that's one of the really gratifying things about retrospecting for me, and that's one of the things that really makes it worth it, is, um, I mean, for me, certainly, I've definitely developed a lot of respect for my levels of resilience. Um, right. looking back at some of my old journaling notes because, you know, I've, I've been through some, personally, some pretty tough times in the last few years and it's been really helpful to see, you know, at the time you don't feel like you're coping very well and then you look back and you're like, actually, I was a rock star and I dealt with that, you know, the best way that I knew how at the time and that's, that's all that matters, essentially. And equally, you know, um, if you if you're someone who finds it quite easy to focus on the negative and problem solve, which is also a tendency that I, I have been known to have, it's really helpful to look back and think. Actually, you know, the past couple of months have been really awesome, mm. and I'm really glad that I've had all these experiences. So it kind of helps you, I think, appreciate the process. You know, this is a bit of a cliche, but it's because it's true. Life is a journey, and it really helps you appreciate, I think, a lot more the ups and downs of that journey. And it's, it's like you're climbing a mountain and you get halfway up and instead of just focusing on getting to the top, which is what you're doing if you're just kind of plowing forward every day, it allows you to kind of turn around and look at this amazing view that's developed behind you mm. um, and appreciate how far up the mountain you've come. I just uh, just wanted to add to, to that um, question that I thought was really interesting, your response. And I, I personally, my experience has been that I really resisted reading back on old journals at first. I mean, I think it must have been a couple of years that I was journaling before I really read back at all. I just yeah. ploughed on, you know, and the act of writing stuff seemed to me that's what I wanted to do, and I didn't really want to go back and read it. I just want, like, I wanted to kind of get it out, get it on down into the uh, journaling application and then just move on. And I finally addressed it in terms of, because I partly through um, the conversations that we've had and the things that you've written about it and seeing that you were reading back on things. And I finally really sort of almost actually pushed myself to go consciously go back and read um, uh, things that I'd written in my journal. And now I find that to be like a treasure trove, yeah, you know, it's absolutely. like a real, it's really interesting. I'm really curious to think like, okay, what three years ago today, what, you know, I wonder what I wrote and to, to go back. And sometimes, especially if you have a journal, um, that's in, um, a journaling application or in a computer of any kind, you can do keyword search as well. So you can, you know, search a place and look at everything that you wrote about uh, like a particular part of town or something like that. And, you know, mm. if you, if you go to a part of town and think, what did, what did I ever write about this place? Then you can go back and, and look. Yeah. And it's like uh, from now that I've overcome that resistance. It's like, I've got this real treasure trove of things to go back and, and look at. And, um, and it was quite scary, the thought of doing so before I started, but actually even the so-called bad stuff, is still really interesting and helpful to read. 
Definitely. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I really, I really like what you're saying about how there's, um, there's like a beauty in the kind of minutia of everyday life as well that you don't necessarily appreciate at the time. But when you go back and you look at all the things that you've done and where you've been and, you know, you've done them with, it's, it's really, um, it's, I find it fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, another thing I was going to say was that um, I, I like I said before, I've, I've also experienced that resistance. And one thing I actually found really helpful for getting around that resistance was um, writing, so sort of doing my journaling on pen and, using pen and paper initially, and then typing up my notes when I finished a notebook. Right. So that gave me enough distance of making time and making time each week to do that. So I didn't do it all in one go because that would take hours and hours and hours. Um, but for example, this year, one of the things that I have really, um, that I really wanted to focus on is my relationship with money and, um, how much I'm earning and so on and so forth. And so I made time on a specific day each week. You know, my, my thing that morning was that I took however long I needed to out to, to work through these books to do with, um, money and earning and I made all my notes and did all the journaling exercises from these books in, um, in a, with pen and paper and a notebook. And I got to the end of this notebook. And now I'm in the process of writing those notes up. And even though it was only two or three months ago that I was making these notes, it's absolutely fascinating looking back now. And it sort of mm. refreshes it in my mind as well typing all these notes up. So that's that's something that I've discovered quite recently that I, I would definitely recommend if you're kind of struggling to find the time and the motivation to retrospect, um, is making handwritten notes initially and then and just writing typing out. them up when you get to the end of the notebook. Yeah, because it also, uh, I've done that too, because I started by journaling on index cards. I was just using them because I could carry some around with me, some spares, and if I wanted to write stuff down. And I, I then... Uh, once I'd started journaling in, uh, digitally, um, I decided that I wanted to put all the old notes into the computer, and so I did type them up. And in a, in a way, the, the, as you say, just the fact that you've got something to do, it's like you have a task to type it up, kind of also helped me get into the process of retrospecting, because I had two purposes for reading it. One was that I was typing it in, mm -hmm. and at the same time, I was also thinking about it and remembering where I was when I wrote it and what I felt yeah. at the time. And with that distance from it, it you know, it's really, it's really helpful. Uh, so, yeah. And also there are, I mean, I found, especially with my journaling, that there are kind of these mini epiphanies that you've, I've never really had one of those huge light bulb moments from journaling where it just changes your whole life and everything you see everything through different eyes afterwards. For me, it's always been very much a kind of steady trickle of mini epiphanies along the way. And I think the thing about mini epiphanies is that because they're not particularly life-changing, you know, they all kind of um, come together and collaborate to eventually, you know, eventually change your life. But mm. um, along, you know, because they're so mini and because they're not essentially life-changing individually, they can get kind of lost. Yeah. And so it's really lovely to kind of go back and revisit these mini epiphanies and kind of have rehab the epiphany <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely because you do also um gain awareness and consciousness of something and you can kind of it can get a bit hazy again oh, yeah. you know so that happens as well yeah. i just wanted to say one thing that might be interesting because a couple of uh, people are writing in the chat window that they're thinking of writing things up and I just wanted to say, you might find it helpful if you're into this kind of thing. I actually got a um, speech-to-text application. So I, I just simply read out my notes to myself and got them automatically typed up. Because um, I can't... Um, I think Claire is asking which one. I was using uh, Dragon Speech, I think. or Yeah, Dragon Speech. Dragon, yeah. That was the one. Um, so, uh, you know, some people might prefer typing because they prefer the actual tactile thing of, of doing that. And, and also these speech-to-text things, or you do have to do a bit of correcting so it can be a bit of a faff. But still, just another option to think about. Yeah. I Personally, I, I can really see the value, especially time-wise yeah. you know, and energy-wise, in reading it out. I'm, I'm more old school, though, and I, I definitely prefer typing because mm. I like to have it formatted in the way that I like it. Well, I know that you also like that this is a difference um, in, in our journaling experiences. I know that you actually like the physical sensation of writing yeah. in journaling initially. 
And I, is, can you say something about that, or what, what that does for you? Yes, I, I've sort of gone back and forth between journaling um, using a um, a computer program called Mac Journal, um, which is a great little journaling program, by the way, if you're interested. Um, there's also a Windows version called Windows Journal, and they're both made by Mariner Software. Um, so I, I've gone between, and that's what I type my notes up into now, and um, I, so I, I sort of alternate between initially doing notes in Mac Journal and then doing them on pen and paper and typing them up and everything. But I've always gravitated back towards pen and paper because there's just something about it for me that feels more natural. And I think there's something around kind of feeling more able to connect to myself and my thoughts and mm. feelings because typing something up on a computer is, is a lot more efficient, um, definitely. And if you're pressed for time, it's, it's a good, it's, it's a really great way of journaling because it is a lot more quicker, um, a lot quicker, so. Um, but I've always found that there is just something uh, that feels a little bit clinical about it. Mm. So if I am if I can see my, you know, because I'm, I'm a, a writer in my day job and I spend a lot of time typing and I find that I very rarely handwrite anything anymore. Mm. And um, I think it's very meaningful to me to kind of have that time when I am handwriting and I am, it, it, there's something about it that just helps me kind of step out of, I think my kind of work mode right. and go into personal mode. Right. Um, and, and there's something for me about being able to see my handwriting as well and um, not having a sort of pre determined font and that is the same for everyone. And it's, it's there's something about it being very individual to me and it's my handwriting and, um, again, that sense of, you know, more connecting to yourself and feel like it's something that's really coming from you. Mm. Yeah. That's really, really helpful. I, I can definitely see that. And it is, there is something very personal about it, but I appreciate your thoughts about it being more the efficiency thing on the, the doing it straight into the journal. And it's one of those things, I guess, that everyone will find their own, uh, their own way of doing it that suits them. Yeah, there's, there's it's, no it's right. not 100 idea as well because there is that time when you look back a few months later, just type it up, and you look at a scrawl and you think, "What on earth?" <laughs> <laughs> Can't remember what I was, <laughs> what was going on there. <laughs> hey guys, could I just add something to that? Go for it. Sure. I, I just wanted to say, I, I the whole um, like computer versus uh, written. I, I've always come back to the to the written form, um, mm -hmm. and I, I keep a couple. You know, when I do make the time, I keep a couple of journals that are strictly written. Uh, I've just found, like for myself, I struggle a lot with, um, my goodness, even if I'm trying to share my own thoughts, I'm trying to correct my grammar or like correct a sentence <laughs> or, so when I'm trying to write online, there's a lot of backspacing and I find when I'm doing it in a written form, you know, if I've managed to at least get the thoughts out of my head, at least I have a record of what the process has been like, wherein if I do it online, sometimes I, I haven't got very much. It, it's like I spent maybe 30 minutes there, but I've spent a lot of time editing. Right. Um, and that, yeah, I've really enjoyed sort of doing the written form more because it, it, it brings another level of awareness to, to what the process is like. It's just, oh my goodness, look how much I want to cross out words and look how much I want to restart sentences, et cetera. Yeah, I really like that point. That's, that's a fantastic point because I've had the same experience. Um, I am I happen to be a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to spelling and grammar, as Jake knows. <laughs> and um, so I, I have a similar experience when I'm typing. And I, I think also because I work, uh, typing is what I do for work and, and because I'm writing it sort of has to be you know as close to perfect as possible and um, it's really hard to get out of that mindset and especially on because on a lot of programs you also have spell check which, which will kick in and automatically and right? lines start popping up and so you feel you need to go back and change them and so yeah I, I really um, I've had a pretty much uh, it sounds like a very similar experience to that where writing um, feels a lot more organic somehow it, it feels like candles versus fluorescence for me. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's a fair comparison, but that's <laughs> yeah. how it works. Yeah, I really like that. And, it's, yeah, it's kind of going back to, um, you know, I don't know, <laughs> plowing the fields and <laughs> living by candlelight <laughs> rather than <laughs> all these newfangled <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. technology and contraptions that we have. <laughs> cool. 
I think what we definitely would like to ask before we finish is how can people who are interested in your book get hold of it? The book is currently available through Amazon. Um, and you can get it on, um, it's available on Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, and um, several European websites as well. I think Italy, Germany, mm. and I want to say Spain, but I'm not 100% sure about that. So um, I can I can check that and post it maybe on the Facebook page. But at least for UK and US, it's, yep, Am- it's, it's on Amazon. It's there, and it's designed to be as accessible as possible. So I think the US version costs two dollars ninety nine, and the UK version costs um, the UK equivalent of two dollars, slightly, <laughs> slightly less, slightly less than two dollars ninety nine in pounds. Um, I think it's something like one pound eighty something. Yeah. Um, so it's it's basically designed to be the price of a cup of coffee. So um, you know, I, I understand that um, the thing about some of the things about some of the personal development programs or books, or whatever that you see, can be prohibitively expensive sometimes. But I want this to be there for as many people as possible. Yeah. Um, so now, if you if you have it's a digital download. But mm-hmm. So if you if you have an Amazon account, but you don't have a Kindle. A physical Kindle, you can still read it. Yeah, right? absolutely. There's Kindle apps for desktop. I think both Mac and Windows. Um, there's Kindle apps for iPhone, iPad, and I think Android now as well. Um, and obviously, if you don't have, if you can also get a Kindle Kindle. Um, the book will be available as a PDF to download from my website, and possibly as a print version as well. I'm currently weighing up options for that. Um, however, I'm currently enrolled in a program with Amazon, which means that I can't release it in any other form until the end of the year, mm. um, so three months from its original release date. Um, but it will be available um, by the end of December in another format because I, I do appreciate that not everyone has access to um, a Kindle or a Kindle app. But it is pretty easy to get uh, to install that free app and oh, yeah. read it. Yeah, that's to. the thing. The app is completely free. So if you have a smartphone, and pretty much any kind of smartphone or tablet, you can read it. Or even on a desktop. Yep, you can read it on desktop as well. It's it's designed to be accessible, so the book is it's well you can um, you can testify to this. It's a pretty short read, isn't it? Mm. Like it's an easy read. It's um it is packed with content, but it's broken down into very bite sized pieces. Um, so people can kind of dip in and dip out as they want to. because um, I appreciate reading on a desktop is not ideal, but you can kind of, you know, yeah. take it in chunks and Totally. Use it as you want. <laughs> and it is the ultimate guide to journaling. Yep, it's the ultimate guide to journaling by Hannah Brame. Do you yep. want to spell your surname? Yes, my surname is spelled B R A I M E. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming on the call, and uh, thank you so much, Hannah, for talking about your fantastic book. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to say before we end, um, even if you, you can't access the book right now, you can kind of read more about it and also more about uh, some of the other stuff that I write about and I'm currently working on at becomingwhoyouare.net. Yes, absolutely. That's your site with yes. loads of resources on yep. personal development. Yeah, I've, I've put... Um, I've put pretty much all the resources I've ever found useful for my own personal <laughs> development up there as a kind of little library. Uh, I run a blog there. I also have information about um, another product that I've released, which is a sentence completion course called Four Weeks to Self-Knowledge. And I'm currently working on another book as well on self-care, which will be coming out shortly. Fantastic. So yeah. look out for that and uh, check it out on uh, becomingwhoyouare.net. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the call and thank you for the amazing questions as well because there was definitely a lot of, I mean, I I really enjoyed talking to you all and there was definitely some questions in there that really made me think about my own process as well. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah. All right, good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night.